Welcome to the Mike on Much podcast. I'm your host, Mike Veerman, and we are joined by my friend and trusted producer calling in from the road, Max Kerman. Max, how's it going? I am doing pretty, pretty good. All right, Max, this is an exciting episode because now joining us in the studio for the first time since his baby Lucy was born is our pop culture aficionado, Shane Christian Cunningham. Shane, welcome back, man. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Shane, you're there? You're, at, you're in Toronto? I'm at work. Ah, oh, are you back at work for like three days a week kind of thing? No, I'm back for n- good, I guess. Until they lay me off, I don't <laughs> <Until> know. <laughs> 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 and now you're on the phone. This yeah, is weird. Yeah. Max, somehow Shane made, managed to make it in, but you're not here. Yeah, I'm running around in Hamilton today, so I apologize. Sorry about that. No need. Uh, so, listeners, uh, on a future episode of the pod, most likely the next one, we're going to uh, really get into uh, inviting Shane back and, and talking about uh, baby life or whatever the hell he wants to talk about, but we're happy to have you back. This episode is probably one of the most, uh, I don't know, unique episodes we've done in our run. Would you call it a Shane Stravaganza? <laughs> we can coin okay, it that. Good work. That is. That, so this is, uh, for our listeners, the Shane Stravaganza, as he has just coined. Yeah, it's easy to say. So Shane, uh, we're literally, <laughs> I mean, you have the keys to the pod this episode. Let our listeners know what they're in for. This is a bit weird, because I kind of, I, I forced... Uh, Mike and Max to allow me to have Nirvana, uh, <laughs> Nirvana the band, the show. N- not that they fought me at all. I, I was just like, the show is amazing. You guys have to trust me. It's like my favorite new show. It's it's almost better than Nathan for you. That was how I pitched it. And then before I knew it, we were interviewing Nirvana the band. Mind you, this interview went about an hour and a half long. So this is a longer episode. I have trimmed. 30 minutes off, but it, it didn't go completely as planned because the day before the interview, I broke my ankle <laughs> and I had been prepping this. I'd watched every episode three times, made so many notes. And I'm like, the day before the interview is when I'm going to organize all these notes. And that's the day I broke my ankle. I was in the ER, so I had no time. I was considering canceling the interview, Oof. but there was no way in hell I could do it after all the the, like it, it was pretty hard to organize the schedules to get them here. And, and as per usual, I, I had nothing to do with your your interview prep, uh, Shane. With, <laughs> no. If it's Mike's, if Mike's interviewing, I get I get right in there. I get on the phone. I you know come together with some questions. You don't care about me. <laughs> no. Why not, though? Not, well, it's a different process. It's a different thing. And I feel like if I interfere with what you want to do. I actually probably get in the way of it. I don't think I help it. Like, you know, for instance, as we know, uh, with a previous episode that needed to be cut yeah. for various reasons, uh, when I, when, as soon as I got involved with your line of questioning, I screwed it up. So you did. I, yeah. I said, yeah. So, so I, I learned my lesson. It's better just to let you roll. Yeah. I kind of screwed this one up on my own a little bit. Like I was, <laughs> as Mike knows, I was fanboying out like crazy because without my uh, interview completely prepped, all I had was my unbridled excitement for having these guys in the room. So I'm not sure if anyone knows that Chris Farley sketch where he's interviewing Paul McCartney and he's just so excited to be interviewing Paul McCartney. He's just <laughs> kind of asking dumb questions and praising them. I was a little bit like that. I tried to mitigate it through the edit. But that being said, you're going to notice I'm a little bit more ramshackle than I would have liked to have been had I not broken my ankle. So I'll say that as a warning. But I still do believe that Matt Johnson's a very well-spoken, educational type of uh, director, writer, actor. And uh, same with uh, Jay. They're very, they don't really need a good interviewer to have a good interview. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think you're you're selling yourself a little short. I thought you were fine in the room, although you were fanning out, which was kind of cool. Because it's like, obviously, you love that show. You really wanted them to come on. You made it happen. Mm -hmm. You reached out to, I think, their agent. And... um, I watched a couple episodes and I, I didn't I didn't binge it like you, even though you were like, watch every episode. Yeah. Uh, and so I so I was in the room and it was kind of just interesting to watch you be like sort of <laughs> incredibly excited and kind of fan out. Yeah, there's not even when the interview went off the rails at times. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's not a ton <laughs> of people like I don't get starstruck by people who are just huge celebrities. I get starstruck by the people you respect. Exactly. So. Yeah, I, I, it did go off the rails at a couple 
cringeworthy moments, which I, I honestly <laughs> tried to uh, cut out, but I, I forgot. Oh, I, I, and I got them to perform a weird task for me. I was asking them to do stuff. I had them make a phone call for me on this episode. And I actually, <laughs> after after the episode, I started reviewing my notes like a madman. Like, I fucked this interview completely <laughs> up. What am I doing? I'm a, such an idiot. And I had like a lot of notes and I was looking through and the main question I wanted to ask was about this one episode where they break into the underground like um, subway in Toronto. Yeah. And a subway car almost hits them. And mm. it's shot so realistic, it almost seems like they actually did it. So all those questions were not asked. <laughs> but I was like, uh, maybe they, they really enjoyed my enthusiasm. I'm going to call the producer and see if I can set up another interview over the phone and just have a quick five-minute interview with uh, Matt Johnson. <laughs> like some follow-up questions. Exactly. And then uh, very kindly, they turned me down, <laughs> which is a testament to my interviewing skills. Um, well, I got to thank uh, uh, Jay and Matt for coming on uh, for what they thought was going to be a 20 minute interview that turned into an hour and 45 minutes of their time. Yeah. And I wonder how they felt leaving the interview. Like, what the hell was that? Or maybe they loved it. They were like, super uh... fucking nice, man. And I think Matt really likes talking process like whatever question they're asked they sort of they they know how to answer mm -hmm. it and take it and i think it's interesting if you're a fan of the show or you're interested in creating shit or like making a show this interview is act like i enjoy just being in the room listening to their answers for that reason should we tell them to stick around for jared Diggs, or should we just wait and get there <laughs> we'll just get there because i was gonna i was gonna say like a tease like and because this is the shane episode we have a very special dessert and then you can set up the cottage once we get to the music okay do that do you want to do that yeah do that okay and like we said, this is the Shane Palooza. Is that what we're calling it? <laughs> Shane Extravaganza. Shane, Shane, Shane Stravaganza. Shane Stravaganza episode. Uh, so we have a very special dessert where, again, uh, Shane has the keys to the podcast. Uh, so stick around for that right now. Let's get to Nirvana, the band, the show. Enjoy this interview. Is this, so we yeah, have this podcast with actually Max from Arkells, who you know, I believe. Oh, yeah. yeah. We know yeah. the Arkells well yeah. because in, in the dirties, my co-star and in Operation Avalanche, Owen Williams, was in the Arkells in high school at Cawther Park. So there you have it. So he was, he was in their band. I'm not sure if Max wants to admit well, that. Well, Max but. was saying that uh, because of you, that's how you have his drummer, Tim. Yeah. He said without you. I, I introduced Tim to uh, Dan Griffin, who was their original keyboard, keyboard yeah, yeah, player. Yeah, yeah. And I was starting a band with them and then... We kind of fizzled out, and I found out later that they were jamming together without me. And you thought, uh, fuck these guys. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's Ben Folds. They, 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 they squeezed you out, man. Yeah, they, they squeezed start, me got out. got a band without me, and uh -huh. they got a different name. Mm -hmm. So anyway, long story long, <laughs> we have this podcast, and uh, Shane literally turns to me like whatever it was, like a, a fucking week ago. And he basically, I guess your brother-in-law, you can tell the story, yeah, but so, so now I, we're all on this train. So I, my, I always knew about your show. I've seen the ads. I'm you know. obsessed with your show, by the way. Oh, really? It's so good. Have I, you seen all of it? I've seen your movies, like everything. You've done it all. I was kind of skeptical if I would like it. I knew it was integrating like real people. Like I was unsure if it was a prank show, if it was a narrative. And then one day my brother-in-law, who's, he's not cheap, but he just doesn't, he doesn't part with money very easily. Yes. And he had a $20 bill and he stuffed it into my pocket. He goes, you're going to love this show. Here's $20 download season one what a guy and so i'm like okay geez if he's gonna part with this twenty dollars this I'm gonna guy check who's it out. so cheap exactly let, let that be a lesson for any nirvana the band fans out there that's all you got to do is go up to your friend somebody who hasn't and you watched pay it yet, for our show and you pay for our show <laughs> you pay so i, I <laughs> used the lesson I, I ended up using the money at a convenience of store course yeah. and like not on the show <laughs> and then i was like oh shit i i'm feeling guilty i need to download this it was like eight at night and i ended up watching like the first four or five episodes and was hooked it was like all of a sudden it was better than nathan for you to oh, me well, or something that's did a huge you, compliment did it take you a, a second to get into it? Yeah, I wasn't sure if I liked your character. I was like, is this guy too much? Oh, yeah, we hear not? that all the time. We hear that all in the real, time. In real life. His face. Yeah. What's with his face? <laughs> I don't like but his the, face. The thing that gets is grating for the first maybe two minutes becomes so endearing. Because they know I loved all your faces and everything <laughs> yeah, about it. Right. And I was like, I hope this guy's exactly like this in real life. And then I looked up all your interviews, and you were so, like, in your interviews, you're so smart and articulate. And uh, not that your character isn't, but it's just like... <laughs> 
you're so different. Uh, in, in well, I think life. both Jay and I are playing ourselves the way that we used to hang out when we were 13 years old. Right. Like that's sort of who we are, um, which is which is not. To, I mean, those characters are de- necessarily quite stupid. suburban kids in the 90s. Yeah, well, but something they, as silly as trying to get a gig, which is actually very easy, but like in your mind you build it up like, oh, we want to play the Rivoli or the and downtown they, Toronto. And show. they believe that the consequences of their actions are going to be global, which I think <laughs> yes, is something yes. that that 13 year olds do believe. Yeah. Like you uh, believe that the things that you do will have privileged, con- privileged yeah, right. 13 year olds yeah. would believe it's like w- when you start a band and you start arguing over song splits before you've even written a song oh, that's exactly it that's, that's exactly the mentality it. That's the, film, the filmmakers who are always thinking okay first I gotta buy the biggest most expensive <laughs> camera and then we can start talking about the movie we're exactly gonna make. yeah that's them just for our listeners how do we describe this show I was trying to do it like I typed out some stuff and I was calling it curb your enthusiasm mixed with like a touch of the comedy show Stella like the internet we never watched Stella no. but we know we, we know really? we know their work. Yeah, is that Michael Ian Black? Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. that's what they did. Uh, sort of when we were first making the web series, and people always okay. told us we should watch Stella, but we never we never did. For us, the closest thing in terms of story is, it's almost like the Ali G show mixed with Flight of the Concords. That's what uh, we're not trying mm-hmm. to emulate that, but certainly those that fits the closest. But Kirk that was third on your list, wasn't it? Didn't you have that? It one? was, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but but you understand. I mean, they're all it's all coming from the yeah. same yeah. thing. Uh, Summer Heights High is also a, a big uh, influence. Uh, it's, it's like Chris Lilly as a performer is a big influence, and The Office is, is also a big one. Yeah, with the way it's shot, in Mark particular, the, the zoom zooms, in. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Zooms. Uh, the premise is two best friends who are in a band called Nirvana the Band, and they're trying to book a show at the Rivoli. But the show isn't about actually getting the gig. It's about the journey in which they're trying to get the gig. It's kind of, it, We always compare it to Pinky and the Brain <laughs> because you, Pinky and the Brain never really talk about what they're going to do when they take over the world. <laughs> that's right. That's, right. that's but, a great point. <laughs> but all the plots are about them like, and all the schemes of how they need to take over the world. That's just... And then, you know... The, the drive. whole theme of it is just like, you know, the journey is is their life. You know, they don't need to take over the world. That is their life. Was the Rivoli chosen for any reason in particular? or it, We picked it when we were quite young. We, we, we were... Some of the most foundational elements of this show were almost done in like one... One swoop. day, yeah. Just of, of joking and, and laughing around when we were hanging around with each other. And we, and we knew, okay, yeah, the Rivoli, that's it. That's like the funniest possible We're trying place. to get a gig there. We kind of had these characters... It's hard to even remember, like, accurately how it came together. But yeah, because it was a long time ago. It, but we were, like, like but, literally, like, 16 when we were doing <laughs> these characters, and I was playing piano with them. And But it's so much like like the rest of the show. It's like it's like how the Supreme Court identifies pornography, right? Like, they, they don't, they can't describe it, but they know it when they see it. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. with us, it was, vi- like, the Rivoli was very much that. Like, we, yeah. we don't know why that exactly was it. We don't know why Nirvana the band was the right name. But we and just said knew when we heard it that that's it's just so funny that a we band were, would have the audacity to call themselves Nirvana. The yes, band. and well, stick the with joke it. Joke was we were in Jumbo Video, and I remember you said, uh, Jumbo- "Yeah," and they call themselves something that that is just so dumb. Like like Nir- they call themselves Nirvana, and I was laughing, I was laughing, laughing, and it's like no, 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 <laughs> no even dumber, Nirvana the band. Just so there's no <laughs> confusion, like they're not trying to be like Nirvana, like some other type of Nirvana. <laughs> But in your defense, you do add an extra end to it. Well, we not we, originally. Not originally. In the original web series, it was one end. In uh, in it was only when we made the move to a to a big uh, like branded broadcaster that we did that, and that was more or less to appease uh, Chris Perez, our lawyer, so that we would have more leeway with the things we could do legally in the show. I actually made a uh, short film called Teen Wolf Three. Oh, great! And I added an extra F uh, to Wolf. For yeah, that, that'll for do that it. Same reason. Nice. Yeah, God knows if that actually does give you any legal protection. <laughs> yeah, I was just doing for a, it. For a certain, <laughs> for, for our guys, it, it, it seemed to mean a lot. It buys you time. Yeah. Yeah, for me, it made me feel like there was a potential I could get sued. So if I added the F, it was like I was m- maybe in the big leagues, like right. just in case. <laughs> Ooh, he had to add an F. So when you started the show, you had all this experience uh, starting with the web show. It was almost like the show was fully formed mm-hmm. on your pilot. So right. it could be have that extra sheen. Or well, we matter. never shot a pilot. We, mm-hmm. we were approved for the whole season before we, uh, before we shot anything. I think because we'd made the web series before. Um, so the, the whole reason that we even went to do this deal. Originally, we were making a different television show for, American Net- for an American network in 2015. Um, mm-hmm. And that was our plan. We like were you'd gone down that road with an American network? They were- we were making a completely different show. With um, with uh, with a fairly famous American comedian, um, not even American, but an American company, and we were uh, going to shoot a demo 
like a 10 minute demo or we something. Had like a sort of half pilot deal. It's funny yeah. how many starts and stops there are on the way to the thing that actually ends up hitting. Oh yeah. Because you think in that moment, like, oh fuck, guys, like, like we're doing this. Like, mm-hmm. well, oddly enough, it was that opportunity that made us and we're beginning to work through that process that made us think, oh man, it would be so much better if we were making uh, Nirvana the band. And that was when Vice came up to us and said, hey, do you guys want to make a show for us? We'll we'll do an entire season if you want. This was right when Vice was well, they, starting. They went up to Matt because he had just sold the dirties to Kevin Smith, and yeah. there was some some good uh, press about that. And Vice was starting Vice Land, and reaching out to like you know people on the rise, and they needed people. And they too. they went yes. they went to Matt and they said, okay, well look, we'll do whatever you want. We'll do something with you. And luckily, he was just like, all right, you know what? Like, we have this pilot deal, so. Why don't we do? Uh, I'll, I'll do Nirvana the band if you guys want to do Nirvana the band. And they're like, "Well, we can do a pilot." And he said, "Well, we <laughs> have." It went like I was yeah. on tour at the time. You were filling me in. I, we, I said, "Well, we have a pilot deal already in the states to make a different show, so we're gonna do that unless you're unless you'll greenlight our a whole series, <laughs> like they're, like we just won't do it until we're done this other show. And this other show might go like we, we might just you'll go lose ahead and us do if it. you don't commit to this, which full- was reality. Yeah." Um, and then, and then they said, okay, well, in that case, we'll, we'll do an entire series. Our show's very cheap to make. Well, one se- they, we'll do one season. One and then, season. And then, long story short, when we finally finished Proof of Concept of our first episode, we had to go in and show uh, Spike Jones, who is sort of like the creative director of You're of in the room Vice with him? Yeah. Oh, yeah. With him. And, Did you and show him the one that ended up ultimately being episode one of season no, one? No, we showed it him was, episode uh, three. Episode we showed three him the, 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 the Christmas episode. Okay. But and it then was a, in the room... It was. It was. I mean, is I that know intimidating how, to fucking walk in a room with Spike Jones? Some intimidating things happened. I wasn't that intimidated yeah. by the concept because we, because we were so happy with the show at that point, and we knew that we were doing good work. And so if, if but our that exec- morning was very. Well, it was intense because we were asking for money because we we needed money to finish the season. And an executive producer comes out that we didn't really know that that well, but all the high up people were there, American people too, and uh, they come out and they said, uh, "Listen." uh, Things haven't really been going well this morning. Some of the rough cuts of other are not shows really are not good. Spike, Nobody's Spike happy. Is not in really the best mood right now. And oh, we walked in. He was in the middle of. Uh, I hope he doesn't firing hear, why someone. Would he hear this. He you knows in the middle of of, of saying to, to to like an intern. You better or something. not tell this story. Oh my god. <laughs> tell it. No, no, we'll cut it if you. The fact the fact is funny. It's just endearing. It's yeah, endearing. Okay. He's he was just kind of a little bit upset in a very Spike way. He was like, oh, he was being given this thing of mixed nuts. He's like, these don't have the. The seeds that I like in the <laughs> I told, I said, uh, oh, it's okay. No, it's okay. He was being really nice about it, but yeah. he had asked for something. He was just having a It was bad just day. A kind of almost a last straw as we're coming in. Hi, Mr. Jones. <laughs> Big fans. And Matt and I sit on like pretty much a love seat in the middle of the room next to each other. And immediately my, my whole bottom of my body is just like sweating against yeah. the couch. And then we start watching our episode and six minutes in the power goes out nobody's laughed yet there hasn't been one laugh six oh minutes in God. not one laugh and so then the That's power torture. dies and we're like well shit and literally the question was asked okay should we get the power back on yeah <laughs> like that was asked and so it was like okay so they get the power back on and then we go to restart the episode and uh and i say okay so should we start it from the beginning and spike's like no 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 from right there's fine <laughs> where, where was we stopped <laughs> And so Eventually, we some pitter patters of laugh and laughing in the room start going, and people start kind of just kind of. Do you remember the, the first laugh? I remember the first laugh very well. I know exactly what it was. It was when I'm drawing that swastika on the. Uh, oh right, the, yeah. as the directions. That's hard to catch unless you're really paying attention. That was the first laugh, and then basically from that moment, it uh, it, it it was like the one of the best screenings we've ever had yeah, and, of our work ever. And it was like the whole room The room exploded, and, it was really and then nice. in the room we got approved for two more seasons. So we left that meeting. This was back. This was back in early 2016. Fuck. And so then we were like, okay, so now we're making three seasons of the show, and we're still in the middle of that. Did He's, Spike ever get his seeds? I, I don't know. <laughs> I, th- I think you know what. After that, he was, was very yeah, happy. Yeah, very it didn't happy. matter. He's in a good mood. Would you consider Spike a friend now, or is that a bit of a stretch? What, whenever we need help. He is the person I email. An ally. Yeah, and so he's helped us with all kinds of really difficult problems. Basically, him and Eddie Moretti at Vice are the the guys who who have our back. They're the reason that we have a show. And so when we need something or when we're having a disagreement or when we're trying to do something that 
that seems like it's impossible, they're who we ask, and they always have the absolute best reactions. So you know in season two in your Halloween episode, uh, you kind of do a, a parody or satire of The Simpsons for the, yeah. the beginning. It, it goes into the graveyard. I was wondering, did you get in, in any hot water when it was saying Viceline 2016 to 2019? <laughs> no. Like in, in the, fact, in nobody the even brought it up. It was, I remember telling somebody, I think one of our editors was just like, should we do this? And I was like, you know, The Simpsons spear like fox all the time all the time like it seems almost in the same vein yeah i think it's a, if anything it's it was kind endearing. of a compliment it's right a, it's an affectionate little jab <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, we're, and like we're buddies and 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 certainly viceland within canada that channel was turned off last month or something yeah. like that yeah. but viceland in the states so is we were still, generous still with 2019 yeah, yeah. It was 2018 <laughs> it's a compliment yeah. yeah it was 2018 but no i mean those guys That's just canada though right yeah that is just canada i heard viceland us is one of the fastest growing uh, networks in um, the the world. Yeah, uh, yeah. They, oh. I think so they still cooking down that. there. You guys are in good position. <laughs> yeah. yeah. My my friend works at Vice, Mark Myers. And, oh, Mark uh, Myers is a great guy. He's the best. He's a great guy. Yeah. I found out recently he has a kid. He looks mm-hmm. like a teenager, and then I found out he's married with a child. Yeah. And I was like, what the hell? Secretly forty two. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how old he is, yeah. but he's not forty two. That's for sure. <laughs> he's thirty seven. Uh, but uh, <laughs> Mark will love Boy, that. He's my friend. Uh, he, he actually did a documentary uh, called Delivery about having his kid, and he uses the same lawyer you guys use for Nirvana the band. Right. The American lawyer yeah. or the Canadian lawyer? Uh, Prez. Yeah. yeah. With Prez is a god. Why would he get an American lawyer? Because we had to, do to it? use all the Seinfeld footage and stuff. Oh, that's why. So he did it because of the fair use side. Because that's one thing that we learned making first the dirties, but then really working with Perez on Operation Avalanche. Um, just how powerful an American lawyer um, and American insurance can be for Canadians working with um with copyrighted material. Because you guys get away with, like, fucking murder on this show. We're, try, we're trying to be right at the edge of culturally what you can I've do. I've never seen anything like this Because no, nobody would ever... It, it, with, with, with Literally, with the dirties, we fell ass backwards into knowing that you could do this stuff. Um, and then with Operation Avalanche, we are like, okay, well, let's try to push this a little bit. And then when we started making the show again, we said, well, let's just go all the way. And well, so every it's... episode, that like, the point is, how can yeah. we be on the tip of the spear? Well, I think it's important to note that in that sort of discovery of what is possible, it's always been the story and what you wanted to have happen in the movies, what we want to have happen in our show, and we we just want this stuff to happen because we like this story, we like this plot, we like this uh, gag that we're thinking of, and we just don't want anything to be in our way. And so we just have like gotten pretty tenacious in fighting every single thing that we want to have happen. And it's been a step-by-step process where it's like, okay, well, we need this song. How do we work with this song and getting this in? Okay, well... Or we need Star Wars. It's a parody. You can yeah. use 30 seconds. Well, we want a minute. What do we have to do to do a minute? Well, you need your parody to be stronger. Sure, we'll reshoot something. Yeah. You know, like we just keep working... Case by case. We have an active relationship with our legal team, which is, which is to say that when we want to do something, we bring them into the creative discussion. So we'll say a great example is when we have that John Cena song at the end of season one, yeah. okay, which is something that we were told flat out is impossible because the WWE will never licenses their stuff because the rights are completely in hell. John Cena was sued. The, the WWE is in crazy like uh, a weird legal territory about how that song was made in the first place. So just like forget it. It'll you never happen. Hard no's. Just so no. often with what we put forward. Well, and I had heard you guys had to go reshoot a scene to make that. We work. shot quite a bit. Yeah. We shot most of well, all, basically every single moment in that episode where I talk about John Cena. But we then shot you could be so funny with yeah. it. Like, yeah. It's hilarious because if you're a little bit almost uh, just, I guess, reckless, and you kind of just like troll yourself with how stupid you could make something. You can kind of dig further into stupidity, and all of a sudden it comes out the other side as a smart, funny idea. It's Kitsugi or whatever, that it's, Japanese it's art of, of when they rebuild a broken plate. You know, it, that's, what, that's what happens with every episode we make. That John Cena thing is like, okay, the episode's fucked. We, it, like, we can't release it because we've built it around this idea <laughs> that John Cena's theme song will play at the end. Oh, but we're not allowed to use the John Cena song. Well, shit, so the episode's done. Like, it's busted. And so then we need to figure out a way to make it so that it will work again legally with this, with what we have. And so in repairing it, somehow we wind up with what you know as the show, which is something that seems like it's made almost in a, like a chaos machine. It's always in repair. 
but it yes, seems perfect another, in the end. That's Our Lady Peace song. Yeah. <laughs> of great, course. Great one song. of their best. Yeah. And the reason you guys are able to do that is because you kind of have a skeleton crew, and you are best friends in real life, so you're always around each other. So it's not a nightmare to just say, hey, let's pick up the camera. No, we work go. every day. Exactly. Yeah. And it's not like uh, like most television or film shoots where it's like, okay, you got 15 days, and you're going to get what you get. Mm -hmm. With us, we're, we're working five days a week, sometimes more, every single day with no set schedule. So it's not like we're shooting this episode from this day to this day. We're shooting what we need to shoot that day to repair whatever it is that we shot last week. Right. And it's always ongoing. And we also don't have scripts or any kind of master document to orient everybody. Um, and, and that's actually quite useful because our team is, you know, the core creative team is about seven people. And so we just all keep the story in our heads through conversation, and it evolves like that. So it's very easy to go out and be like, okay, so what are we doing now? Oh, yeah, we're fixing that John Cena thing. Oh, what are we doing with this episode? Oh, yeah. And there's no director, really. We just go you know and do I mean? it. Like we, uh... <laughs> but you get credited as being the director. Well, I'm ultimately the person that's got to say yes or no to everything. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. So okay. It's also, yeah, he's, he, he's quarterbacking the whole thing with – overseeing and micromanaging everything whereas a lot everyone also does so many different roles where i'm also involved in pretty much every aspect too but um you gotta you guys get annoyed that um everyone just wants to know every single thing of how every episode <laughs> is made like are you uh hesitant to reveal your secrets every episode well, a lot of things we won't talk about normally but but <laughs> i no, want to know everything but it's but it's, it's definitely exciting that people it's, want it's, to know it's the reward of like you know like it's so much of what makes the show fun for us is how we did it and how we got away with something and how we were able to do something. And so when people kind of ask us those questions, it's like, yeah, that is kind of the fun of it. It's nice that they noticed. It <laughs> this is so hard, right? Depth. Yeah. It's so hard to do some of this shit. I think eventually, like, we don't want to kind of give it all away right now because the mystery is actually really fun. And yeah. watching the show with a how and how, like, that, that question keep like if that keeps entering your mind that's the great zone to be watching the show but eventually we're going to do like a bunch of making of or some sort of when, behind the scenes when we're a magician is like, a magician is far more enjoyable if you're kind of like wowed by how they're doing their shit without knowing the mechanics exactly yeah. and as much as we divulge we're literally just the tip of the iceberg of right. how we've gotten away with it. some things it's all tricks glitches and hacks well i have a bunch of Questions here about kind of like you so can, uh, feel free to you say <laughs> feel free to say no to them. But I'll tell I, you our, our I think our main philosophy, both Jay and I and our whole team, is no questions. <laughs> yeah, <it's> don't <laughs> ask, don't right. ask, don't tell. Fuck is off. that? We, I think we, we don't talk about that often, but we really like the I should say Jay and I really like the philosophy of David Blaine. I, I, I like a lot, <laughs> like what David Blaine does in his act, where he's like, okay, no, this was just hard work, and this was something I'll never tell you. Like that split. There's a great speech that David Blaine gives at TED about how he held his breath underwater for a long time. If you haven't seen it, you should watch it. He, okay. he cries at the end. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. And it's, um, it's, it's, it's extremely inspiring, inspiring. And I think the idea is, like, we want, we want to do things that people feel a sense of wonder for, at least the people like us, like the people who sort of are interested in the same things that, that our team is interested in. When they see this, they'll be like, oh... I wish I could have done that, or I wish somehow that's speaking to me. And, uh, and a part of that is the magic of, like, well, this seems impossible. How, how is that, that possible? How yeah. Is, that's your imitation, right? Okay. How? How do you do it? Watch. <laughs> Watch. Why? Why is that happening? Why is it happening? <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. Watch. Why? No, but look, look, look. No, look. Look. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the good one. But I think that's his power of uh, persuasion, or what's it called? The, the sleight of hand where he's... Mm -hmm. Uh, controlling where people, people's focus. focus yeah, is. controlling their focus. Yeah. And yeah. he's unassuming, which is another great mm -hmm. trick you can learn from David Blaine. Um, not that we really are the hugest David Blaine fans, but really he's so unassuming that in the same way that we try to be like so stupid looking, we, like our show looks like shit. It looks like it's just thrown together by morons, really. And so you don't expect anything to happen that is going to make you question the construction of it because it seems so lazily done that when yeah. something crazy Brilliant. does happen you mm. go well wait a minute mm. that doesn't integrate with the 
with the me judging this book by its cover mm -hmm. that I had in the first minute of this episode, these guys seem way too stupid mm -hmm. for me to be uh, feeling or thinking what I'm thinking right now. So what's going on? And that is a real David Blaine move. Well, and you guys are believable in your characters. Like, I'm disappointed that you're not that guy. You know what right. I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I want you sometimes. to come in and, and be that guy. But then when the story all of a sudden is so smart and put together perfectly... I'm like, wow, how did they do that? Because seemingly it seems like I could pick up a camera and shoot your show. Right. And then it's like, no, this is a fucking incredible amount of work. That's the, the editing, hardest part. Yeah. The, the crafting the story of stuff. the breaking the story because like, yeah, yeah, aesthetically it looks, oh, we can go down Queen Street and fuck around, but that's not it. There's so much more going on within well, the show. None of us really have that much. I, I, a lot of us went to film school or something like that, but... Uh, none of us really are like screenwriters and story writers. Not at all. We've, we figured all this out again in repair. Like hmm. we, we just, we know a good story when we see one and we, and we can always be very honest with ourselves and diagnose when something just sucks and it doesn't work mm -hmm. or this, this character motivation is wrong or like this needs some resolution here or this needs more conflict here or, or whatever the specific thing is. We diagnose it and we, won't stop reshooting and repairing until it finally comes together. And and all of us agree, okay, yeah, this works. And we have such an amazing group of, of friends that aren't... I mean, sometimes we delude ourselves, that's for sure, but for the most part, we're like, okay, this still sucks. Like, this is still really bad. And we have that conversation every day. It's something that we brought from our web show to the people that we work with, and now the whole team has adopted that mentality, and it's created this... House of uh, Building Frankenstein Monsters. Okay, I want to get into some of the episodes. Sure. Chapter one, the very first episode, is called The Banner. In this episode, to get the Rivley's attention, you take a picture of yourselves at Sears yeah. and end up blowing it up to the size of a huge banner. Yeah, gigantic one. Going on top of a building and then throwing the banner down in front of the Rivley. And in that picture of you guys, Jay's penis is out. It fell out accidentally in the Sears. Because I insisted right. on wearing tight leather pants because I thought they were very rock and roll. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's obviously a very uh, hilarious premise. How much of that was real in the terms of were you guys actually illegally on the roof putting the banner down without permission or... Well, I mean, you, it, it, with that episode, what you see kind of is what you get. So we, the, I'll say this, you can't get permission from the city to put a poster down over residential buildings. So you, you're obviously the mindset of just shoot it and ask for forgiveness. Yeah, and, and like, like most of our episodes, we try to get in and out. The real thing is when people ask what you're doing and you can't give them an answer that is going to allay their suspicions. Sure. That's, that's when you got to move. For the most part, people are just... They're, they're too polite to ask, you know, even if it's security or something like that. For the most part, they're just like, oh, these guys don't seem like they're causing any harm. When we shot at the uh, Maple Leaf game, that was another great example of that, where we thought, well, there's no way this is possible. How are we going to get into Maple Leaf Gardens? Or I guess it's the ACC now. Or when we yeah. shot on the... How do you even get the camera in? Right, we had to yeah. sneak them in piece sneak by piece. In. Oh, so it's so kind of like John Malkovich yeah. in the line of fire? You have to uh, fucking reassemble uh, yes. it? Yes. <laughs> another funny so the cameras one is, we had to uh, break apart and then build on in On our way to Sundance, there. when we were planning on shooting in the plane... And, right. you know, we got these big camera things and we uh, selected our seats where Matt and I are together. Jared's down here and Lucas and Andy's over here and, and the, he's down the hall. And we're on the plane. We have to do this plane scene and they have to kind of take out their big camera and start assembling <laughs> this thing, which is very oh my suspicious. And at first they're trying to do it. You know, <laughs> oh, and then we get away shit. with the scene and Matt and I are kind of being big and loud. And then we keep redoing the scene and people are like, are they saying the same? things over and over again. <laughs> Andy and Jared are being really discreet about their cameras. And then we kind of look at we're, each other. We're at, we're at 20,000 20, feet. 20,000 feet. At, like, what can they do? We look at each other as after the flight attendants walk by a bunch of times seeing us. We're like, hmm. And then Jared just gets up on his seat like this, <laughs> just over top of everybody. And everybody's, you know how it is, right? Yeah. The like planes are all just looking one way. So everybody's all of a sudden looking at Jared peering over the seats with a huge camera yeah. pointing over all of them. <laughs> on and this and it's five-hour flight. And it's just fine. And Matt and I just keep doing this scene over and over again. Loud. Loud. And that's, like, such an expensive shoot if we were going to do that, oh like, with permission. Yeah, well, it, we, it just wouldn't be possible for a show like ours. Which, again, is a, par is a part of that weird, like, well, what am I watching? Because, again, a show of our scale can't have a scene in an airplane. You can't do it. It's not possible. It's not legal. It's too expensive. You can't do it. And so when there is a scene in an airplane, at least for, for us, those are the types of moments that make you go, 
whoa, what's about to happen? Because if that's possible, what else is possible? Yeah. Are, do you guys get uh, confident when you're in character or are you still aware while you're shooting a scene that, oh, I'm kind of nervous that it's going to go awry? I can say for myself, you may feel the same way that I, I feel completely different than I do in real life. Mm -hmm. It's like I'm, I have a complete, uh, like I have total confidence, I, almost an immunity. Like I feel like I can go and talk to anyone about anything mm -hmm. because I'm justified yeah. in talking to them in a way that in real life you just aren't. Like you can't go up and just talk to a stranger. But these characters have such impetus. Like they know what they want and they know how they want to get it. And that gives you permission to talk to anybody and yeah. say anything. Because you, you're like, well, look, I need to get this show at the Rivoli. It's life or death for me. So. I need your help, or I need to tell mm -hmm. you this, or I need you to do something for me. Let's say a scene is busted. Like, let's say it's, you're actually busted, you're shut down. Happens all the time. Do you stay in the character? That's I, the best part when you do. We, yeah. we, 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 we always do, especially if we know the cameras are still on. The only time that it's ever gotten like, oh. This is what I'm getting to. Like, say, like, on the plane, they're like, we're actually going to fucking land this plane if you guys keep shooting. Like, do you stay in the character all the way till the end? Or at some point you go, okay, listen. Well, no, well, it's interesting. Think about it. Matt and Jay, they always have the same excuse, which is, oh, yeah, we're, we're, they're making a show about us. We're trying to get a show at the Rivoli. Yeah. And that's so it's disarming. Not, it's actually not that far away, even if in the most dire circumstances and the cameras are down at the waist and we're getting in serious trouble and Matt and I can't really screw around with anybody anymore. We could still not screw around with them in character. Like right. it's, it's just this far away. And if we do need to say something, it's like, no, 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 it's, it's for Vice, it's a television show, it's legit, or something like that, we cut that out. Like we know that we can sort of But you will do that this. in the moment and then just doesn't We've never that. actually done that before. Not that, but... We've, we've never said, don't worry, this is a real TV show because that's not normally what people want to hear. Yeah, that's, they don't <laughs> want to hear. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's we getting paid? Yeah. In fact, really yeah. what we often say is this is nothing and we basically present ourselves as our characters, mm -hmm. which... For the most part, as you see in the show all the time, people go, oh, these guys are brain dead. Or, yeah. oh, these guys are so stupid. And their innocence is the reason they think they can do this. So my job isn't to punish them. My job is to let them know, because they're so dumb, that what you did isn't um, allowed. And that's it's almost as far as it ever gets. That's fascinating. Well, Jared had a really great solution for when we were shooting you in the uh, change room at uh, Champ Sports. you right. camera sticking through the... The, the men's curtain, change room, men's like shooting change into room. a change room. And the guy, like the, the champs guy comes up, he's like, what do you guys think you're doing? <laughs> and Jerry looks over at him and he goes, uh, and I look at him like, oh shit, like we need to get more of this scene. He's like, it's for a bachelor party video. <laughs> And the, guy was, and the guy, and the guy said, yeah. cool. <laughs> <laughs> right on, bro. It just keeps it moving. And, and he looks at us and goes, okay, all right. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. <laughs> and we're like, perfect. <laughs> because, again, we're not – almost never, except for, like, those really crazy scenes where we're, like – where it's, like, destruction of public property. It's – we're never causing a disturbance for people. And so to have us just kind of exist in the world of your store or your restaurant or the street, it's like we're not really that much of a change from the everyday. Plus, Toronto has enough – crazy shit going on that there's other things to focus on. We find that when we're shooting on, on the streetcar, for example, there's always somebody louder or drunk exactly. or crazy or dangerous. It's bothering that, people a lot more. That's way worse <laughs> than us quietly filming at the And back. you guys aren't mean characters Ever. either. You're as well-intentioned. No. Exactly. You might seem a little crazy at worst, or maybe like you're on cocaine. Sure, <laughs> but we're well-raised. Exactly. That's what we always say. We always say and, that these are well-mannered kids. And we've always said the same thing, where we, we never really want to make anyone look bad when it comes to selecting the penis size for the band was jared. <laughs> jared jared made that decision completely on his own or were you involved in that decision you don't know if it's my penis or not i know i penis? know it is your penis did you get final cut on that editor's note i would just like to acknowledge mike's circumcision joke as i did not notice it in the room nor did anyone else and i think it deserves a big shout out anyways proceed with the episode that is your penis? Well, that Jared was stretching it. I know that happened. I made a deal with Jared, and, and Jared made a deal with me back that we would never reveal okay. how much it was stretched. On, only, I guess, certain people in this world know. Was there ever a discussion like, maybe it's funnier if you have a really small penis? Uh, well, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have ever agreed to that. <laughs> <laughs> Weirdly enough, no. That you know, because well, that's not that's really not our, our style. style. We we were yeah. actually like at first when we this thought this idea, might have been too much. It's like because we hate we hate like fart penis shit joke. Like we don't like 
like gross humor. gross out comedy yeah like a lot of that like we love like uh tim and eric stuff but all that sort of like you know squishing sounds and kissing and like you know grossness it's just never been our style yeah and so when when we were thinking about our pilot having a dick joke in it it was like a real like well we got to make sure this is grounded in some clever plot action so we and was that humanity really out on the street oh yeah oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah again what you see is what you get almost all the time it's very rare for our show to just because that's so hard do you know how hard it would be for us to put a like a digitally put a penis frame mapped to that poster in every single handheld shot are you aware that you are exposed kind of in one episode yeah well then where my nuts come out of that yeah that happens <laughs> yeah. to me all the time <laughs> oh, okay and you know uh, but it, it was it, a real true accident uh, yeah i didn't i didn't do it on purpose yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I'll tell you what's great about <laughs> right. this. For our listeners, in, Shane in, just in, pulled out a shot of it and handed it. Yeah, that's, I'm totally. that's actually his, his weird looking penis. Is that a weird bulbous penis? No, right? that's a, or a nut. Ball? <laughs> <laughs> so in the dirties, I, uh, I I show my nuts, and it's based on a joke from the original web series where uh, my neighbor yeah. said, "This is a chicken brain that I learned <laughs> that I saw when I was." Eight or nine years old, and I was like, "Whoa!" No, adults tell jokes in a funny way. Ch chicken brain is, is a popular thing. I know it's popular, about. but I learned about it from my neighbor. Yeah, okay. And so anyway, so I put Ryan that in the dirties. Ryan or something? You, you don't say his name. That's my friend. <laughs> so anyway, chicken brain. so then mm -hmm. in this scene, I'm running from the bunk bed to go to the bathroom, and yeah, my nuts are often falling out of my underwear, but I didn't realize that it had happened. In the show, and so when Jared showed it to me afterwards, I was like, "That's the tape we're using. <laughs> we got to use it because it happens so fast yeah. that you know the network didn't even say anything about it." I believe it. it. My wife spotted it, and I was like, "No!" And then we went frame by frame, and yeah. then we took a picture of it. Well, yeah. you could tell because I reached down and, and sort of slide them back in. And but that's those are one of those the miracles of uh, television, yes. live performance. It's a miracle. It is really? because you know <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you why it's a miracle, and I'll defend that. It's well, a miracle. It's, I'm not really coming at you. It's with that a thing. miracle because if that was intent, you could never do that intentionally you'd mm -hmm. have to be like a charlie chaplin-esque perfect physical actor yeah. to be able to make your to intentionally ball, pull ball that out of your pants yeah. perfectly and make it seem like totally laissez-faire yeah that's mm -hmm. wonderful vaudeville ball work yeah. yeah so the fact that that happened by accident and was captured in a way that you can see it but not so much that the networks flagged it and wouldn't let us release it that is a miracle it's a miracle and you proved it this is one of my favorite Thank episodes you. actually <laughs> me the too buddy. it actually yeah. is my favorite episode of the second season and it's uh, obviously you're it's parodying What's the word? Is it satire or parody? Uh, with Miss Doubtfire. Legally, the word is parody. <laughs> okay, so you're parodying uh, Miss Doubtfire, yeah. and you you come up with this character who actually kind of tricked me at first. Uh, oh really? I, I'm shocked to hear that. <laughs> like your accent was pretty good. I was pretty convinced. But there's a scene when you're kind of partying with Jay, and you pay a couple of prostitutes, I guess, to have a good time in the back That's of the right. limo. Yeah. And one of the prostitutes, her boobs are out yeah. and not blurred. Right. And another one are blurred. Yes. Uh, were those real prostitutes? And what was the discussion on which prostitutes <laughs> boobs get? <laughs> a question that we never really thought we would get. Yeah. Sure. Oh, I can I can give you the real answer, which is that you you obviously watched a lot of the show, and you probably noticed that all of Jay's swearing is bleeped. Yeah. Right. And so that was the continuation of that same motif, because the girl ah. he's with is is completely censored, and the one that I'm with isn't. I thought maybe she was like found out about the show afterwards, sent an angry email. No, I think that <laughs> that had we wanted to, uh, it would have been fine. But it was just, uh, I think Kurt did it. it. Like Kurt, the editor, uh, uh, put this in, and it just fit perfectly. The the character you invented in that episode was that Tony. something you had invented uh, previously? I, but I mean, no, yeah. I'll tell you what it is. Jay and I always used to do an impression of um, soap from. Um, yeah, from well, it's, yeah, it's between that and Tony Erdman. And t well, Tony Erdman, the movie is a German film, a German comedy that came out a few years ago. The, the dad who's trying to stay in his daughter's life. Yes, and that's where it does all the characters. He only makes one character, and the oh, character's that's what, name yeah. is Tony Erdman. But he okay. speaks German and is kind of funny, and he wears fake teeth. And so I thought, oh, I'll wear the fake teeth just like Tony Erdman, but I'm gonna talk like this character Soap from the uh, was it Battlefield? What video game was it? Call, Call of Duty, Duty. Yeah. from from the old Call of Duty game, who sort of talks. In all this, right, Roach. let's go. All right, you and me, two and of them up front. <laughs> I got the one on the right. And he's a, he's an assassin. He's a sniper trainer who's basically training a sniper. Get but down. he's so matter of fact that we would always laugh at how matter of fact this guy was about training these snipers. And so we'd always do this impression. And so Tony, it's kind of a mix between that Tony Erdman, and then we have a friend named Josh Bowles that kind of some of his sartorial sense comes from a little bit. But um, but. Uh, <laughs> But no, that was just put, to be honest, to be perfectly honest with you, I was like, I hope 
like struggling with that. There like, wasn't much thought. There wasn't like I put it on and I was doing this voice and I because it's real, right? Like Matt is trying to come up with a character, and so yeah. he just does whatever he can, puts this stuff I together. I was really trying to get him some glasses to disguise him more. Like I didn't want you to wear sunglasses. <laughs> And I had I sent Belanger to try to find a bunch of different glasses that like magnify the eyes to really oh, kind like of distort bubbles. his yeah. Yeah. yeah like bubbles like exactly bubbles. but none of them really worked and by the time he actually put some on <laughs> he looked like uh, we were going with a different direction well it wasn't did quite right. change your face just yes enough, they did they though, changed yeah. my face and they changed my voice and those teeth I loved wearing them Belanger built those teeth and. I, man, the reason I love that episode is because it's so, well, I mean, I want to get into this, but it's so much about, like, what really is going on between these friends. The idea yeah. that, the, the premise There's of the episode is, a lot is, of heart in it. is that Jay's going to go to a party and he doesn't want Matt to go with him because Matt is just not cool the way that Jay's cool. And so Jay, Matt, in trying to show Jay that he's cool, although not really, he's actually just trying to implant this plan on you, but really what he's doing is he's trying to show Jay that he's cool. And that journey really shows them each how much they love one another and how much of a betrayal it was for Jay to say you're not cool enough to hang out with me. And so when they both realize that, that that's a real high point of the series for me. And just comedically, when after you perform the Heimlich maneuver and the bouncer tries to communicate with Which you. Which is crazy. That and guy you're was so just, real. You're just stunned and not saying, totally ignoring the bouncer. And then someone eating at the restaurant is like, I think they're just in shock. <laughs> yeah, like, that's that's what, a waitress. really funny moment. Oh, you, do you know what it? that's based on? You guys might know this because you're, you're from Ontario. Yeah. yeah. So in the 90s, do you remember that uh, 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 Concerned Children's Advertising commercial where the two, where the brother's doing drugs and he goes and meets him in the hospital? Mm-hmm. And, and they have a hug. At the oh, yeah. The, and they the, hug. I love that song. Yeah. Well, dude, that is what mm-hmm. that entire scene's a parody of. We use the yeah. same song. We use the same footage. I wondered how, because I was like, it must be. I told, I told my wife. Literally literally that's is. another parody trick that we did where we were only able to use 45, 45 seconds. 45 seconds. Yeah. And so Jay but wrote the a, rest of it. It's a minute and a half. And I wrote the middle piece of music and stitched it together if you can barely hear it but at one point the song changes and kind of does a different progression but i mixed it the exact same way and panned all the instruments <laughs> the same yeah, way i love that shit. and then it went back in. we did it again with like uh, the breaking bad stuff where i'll have to go in and score something where it sounds the same but i move the notes around right. a little bit just just enough so that it's original. It's something a lot of people don't know, believe it or not, when, when, we, when we talk to them about our show, or even I think fans who watch the show, is how much, in the same way that Tristan Zarafa, the VFX supervisor, like makes the show into this completely different beast, Jay, being a true, honest-to-God musical prodigy, lets us do all kinds of crazy shit that other shows can't do. We can play any song that we want as soundtrack because Jay can just recreate it in like five minutes. He can play anything. He can hear the theme song to Breaking Bad was a good example, but then we did all these Indiana Jones songs. We did everything. And basically, we go right to the edge of what our lawyers will let us do, and then Jay can fill in all the rest. Like recreate some Muzak sort of anything. Yeah. Or just patch something at the yeah. end of this that it has an ending. Or the episode where we make based change on Wahlburgers. Change back to the future a little bit. Yeah, I love yeah. that. Where episode. we use, oh well, God. we were fucked because so much of the actual Wahlburgers footage with Marky Mark doing interviews or of them uh, uh, talking in the Musical. show has music over it and so we couldn't intercut it with our show so jay would go in and recreate that music in between scenes perfectly threading these things and these are the types of things that other tv shows can do of course but they need to hire somebody outside of the team work with them for weeks and pay thousands and thousands like they oh they man like to use like a sports now if you have all-stars on your roster like at, like your team is full of people that can do all these things at a high level. You don't it, have to go hire specialists. It's like fuck it, we can do it all. It house. is. It is the secret to this show. Yeah, is that that the, the team is small and everybody can do things that are extraordinary beyond just oh, I'm an actor on a TV show. Exactly. Right? Like, so much fun too. Of course, because so it gets to be, to be to your whole things. life. It doesn't yeah. feel like work, right? Because you're no. getting excited as you're doing it, and it becomes its own sort of math problem. And you're your own boss too. Where it's like I need to make this as best as I can make it. For myself. For myself. Yeah. I, I need to judge this harshly. In the show, you kind of touched on this, but I was thinking it before it even had come to this episode. Are you guys actually improv? Like, are you an improv expert in real life? No, or? neither of us are. Have you gotten that far yet? What's, oh, you, of course. Okay. Yeah, I've seen them all like, okay. three times. So, so, yeah, so if you're listening, we do an episode where we snuck into a Second City improv class because I wanted Jay to learn how to improvise because I say he can't improvise and we've got an improv plan. But long story short, it's we so actually funny. went into a oh, real improv class. That was the most class. like hidden camera show 
type thing that we've ever done, like where there were like curtains and, and the, the camera guys were all wore hidden. black gloves in, in the in the shadows and <laughs> did, did nobody the knew. Wow. Not even the teacher. Yeah, no, no, no. Of course okay. the teacher knew. The teacher's our friend. Yeah. The te- in fact, if you watch the original web series, you see that guy makes an appearance. Mm-hmm. That's one of Jay's very good friends from uh, improv class. Mm-hmm. I and love his demeanor. In, he's in the episode, best. Yeah. When I leave and he goes, okay, thanks, Matt. Yeah. And I leave. <laughs> it's like, oh, he's, he's one of those true talents yeah. that can do a whole lot of different things. But his I, name's Reed Janice. And in fact, he's, he's a, like a, quite a capable actor. He's acting in tons of commercials in the city. And we knew we needed him as an anchor because if the entire class was going to be real – we needed somebody to move our story yeah. along that wasn't Jay or me. Because if it was Jay or I, people would be like, what the fuck? Right. You can't control this they'd class. They'd sniff it out. Well, they or would they'd say, you're think not in charge they're... here. Ah. And so with having somebody in charge who was going to kind of keep the peace, we knew we could get away with that with the crazy and shit that we like did. that was like day one of an improv class, right? That was yeah. literally a beginner's class, yeah, people who'd thinking. never improvised before. And were, were you feeling heightened pressure? Like, okay, I know the scene requires me to be funny, but I actually have to be funny for this scene to work? Or are you just charming them into laughing at you? Uh, well, I mean, that's very generous. I think that I was, pretty, I was hamming it up pretty badly. <laughs> and yes, I did feel pressure to do that. And we had another scene that was cut, too, where I actually performed with real improvisers. On stage. On stage. Supposing, like, and I had to be killing it for the plot, where Matt's going to come in and see me killing it and be all dejected. That was a, a separate... Well, maybe... We'll release that ending later, but that was really hard to do because I truly am not that good at right. improv, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I fell flat many times. Fact, Never I, taken classes. Jay used to be the musical director at Second City, but yeah, right. so I know like I know that style of improv, like stage live improv, which I think is far more impressive than the sort of improv that we do. Like the, the it's hard. I know. Almost every improviser in the city through working at Second City for seven years and just the comedy community and some of the people in this city are just unbelievable talents with with improv. And we don't do that. We have our own... Ben. Oh, it's Ben. Notice me. Notice me. For for the listeners out there, Ben Mulroney just walked by. (laughs) And he just gave us one quick look 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 and looked away. Earlier, Chelsea Clinton walked by. Mm -hmm. She took a peek in here. Did you guys see that? Uh, I wouldn't recognize her, but... Very cool. Anyway, um... Improv. We just do our own thing. We have our, our own thing. thing. It's easier when you have the safety net of knowing it doesn't matter because you can edit it out. Right? That That's is an unbelievable power. Yeah. And that is the other part of the recipe that gives us such confidence when we're performing in that we both know absolutely nothing we do that we don't like is ever going to make it onto television because we literally control everything. A fun thing, though, is that we got a lot better at through... Like in the web series, when we started improvising, if you were to look at the raw stuff of us trying stuff <laughs> out, you would see a lot of misfires of character jokes and all that. And then uh, by the end of the web series, we started, like, when we looked back at after things, how they can be edited together, and it, it almost defined our characters and it defined our dynamics so that now when we can go into it, we can at least kind of be playing in this world. And so as improvisers, yes, we're masters of that craft in this one specific thing. But we actually were just asked to join the Second City cast for an improv night where they wanted us to join the set afterwards. Oh, yeah. Shahori kind of asked nightmare. us to do it. Yeah, right. And I, and I told him, I'm it. like, you know what? Just tell them that, that we're cheats and we don't know how to do that. And we cheat at our show. We, and we, we would not know how to keep up with them. We probably would have a good time doing it. We just yeah. hosted a, a, an opening live stage show for the for the Born Ruffians last week. And when it's Jay and I and we can kind of be ourselves, it's great. But to me, I think so much of improv is acting in the way that the character, right, the character who you are, would act in that situation. And so for us, we have a great shortcut in that we both know our characters so perfectly yeah. well. So whatever you throw at us, we have an answer because it's it's integrated into us. Mm. Whereas in improv, you're switching characters so quickly. You're a bus driver now that exactly. just lost his wife. And, it's and like, making decisions on what yeah. does this new character think. And that's something that I'm not sure that, well, we have zero experience doing it. We should go do it, though. Yeah, I guess I just hate live performance. I hate it. <laughs> we'll bomb, but it'll be fun. Yeah, yeah. I'm Mike so- and I uh, took an improv class once. Yeah. And I, in real life, I'm like, oh, I'm kind of a funny person. I it might should, excel It should at be this. so easy. Then the person wasn't doing what I wanted them to. I'm like, what the fuck? You're well, ruining where I'm headed here. That's why we <laughs> made that episode. There's a, there's a real, con- there's, there's a constant thick skin that I've developed of being in this character where I need to kind of stay in character and watch people react to me doing something really embarrassing, and I see their eyes fall <laughs> in a sort of just really pathetic, 
way where they just look at me like I'm a pathetic <laughs> loser. Or brain dead. Or brain dead. Or I go, <laughs> go ask them for help and I start putting on my character with them and they kind of just like, their face drops like, oh no, this is an ordeal now. I'm dealing with a crazy person. One of the best examples of it that's I in I want to reach out and I want to say like, ah, I'm, no, I'm, I'm not this crazy, <laughs> is when he's in Sundance and, he, and the people come up to him and they're like, do you guys know, do you, do you know any place where we can go that's cool and free? And Jay goes, well, I would say go see my movie, but <laughs> my friend, my betrayed, friend me. betrayed me. <laughs> and then they look at him like, oh, this is a crazy like, person. Yeah, oh no, yeah. and now they're, they're caught. <laughs> and and then, then he says, but... What are you guys doing? You want to hang out? Yeah. And then the girl who immediately before this had just said, we'll hang out with you, yeah. now says, you know, we're yeah. just kind of uh, wandering. wandering, you know, we're just sort of wandering. And then they turn towards the camera down the street yeah. that they don't know is there. And we can see her make that face. Like Where a, she's like, oh, oh my God, shit. this poor crazy idiot. And then Jay has to stand there and walk away in tears. <laughs> is that a page out of Nathan for you where he always wants to end up hanging out with them inevitably? N- not, not consciously. Not consciously. No, 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 not at all. No. Are you a fan of Nathan? Of Huge. course. Of course. Yeah. We go every single time he comes to Toronto to do his live show, live screenings. We're always there. I mean, I mean that show we love. That's kind of the premise of not our pod, but my portion of the podcast is called the Dessert, and we try to find Nathan Fielder and get him on the podcast. I'm sure he'd do it. He won't. He's the hardest fucking guy. We've offered him a million dollar check I to s- do it. Yeah, we even like we have it. Here. One million. And we've, like, got the Arkells to retweet it. Like, if you'll get them on. Like, we've done all these, like, publicity stuff. We have, like, friends that, like, write for Last Man Earth that are, like, actually friends with them. Like, watch sports with them. Reach out. And he just, he doesn't go on things. He's done his buddy Chris Maybe this is a mistake for us to have come on. (laughs) (laughs) We made a mistake. We've had bigger people than Nathan Probably because he he is, like, a a true professional in that he really doesn't want anybody to know what he's doing. He's He's kind of... time now. Also, he's moving into a real real Andy Kaufman area, area where I think that I think even for him to be questioned on what it is that he's doing and why he he's doing it, he doesn't divulge. Not at all. Yeah. He, everything that he does, his whole his uh, whole career is kind of based on him doing interviews, and it is part of his. Like it's like okay, this is part of his. Thing. He doesn't want to get into process. Like he is almost like a magician that where he's like, I don't yeah. really want to talk about how I do what I and, do. And I think a part of the trick is nobody's ever going to know the real him. Yeah, which is which I think for him quite important. And we're we're being real right now <laughs> yeah well i think nobody's we're, saying nobody's thinking like oh this the nirvana the band scheme i know it well maybe nobody's, some people are are thinking yeah this is all a big act i think because i came from a film school background and because so much of uh making those early movies and even when jay and i were making the show i think a lot of this may seem like pat or stupid but normally when people came up to ask us how we did these things or how we why we were doing this is because they wanted to work in film and, and television. Yeah. And I was always happy to say, okay, here's what we did. It's not that hard. Here's what you can do. And I, a, a large part of my adult life has been trying to let people know how they can do these same things. And so it's very hard to have that as, a, as, as something you want to do for Canada and also be, you know, Secretive Mysterious, and not let anybody yeah. know how you yeah. how you work. So so it, it's it, it, you can't walk that line. It's like I've watched a lot of your interviews where you pretty much answer every question that someone asks for the most part. The how not to them. get sued on YouTube. Yeah, I think like for I thought that, that you guys great. did. That was really informative. And then you talk yeah. to this gamer like on uh, Facetime, I guess. Like, oh yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. we'll talk to anybody who 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 like genuinely. But you're cares very good about, about revealing how, how you guys do it. And that, that's what I want to do with Nathan Fielder. I, I doubt he would, though. Of course not, because, again, he'd have to drop the facade. But I have a plan still. Yeah. Like, uh, in, in, the, in the nature of your show, I guess, I've been able to get his uh, manager's number. And I was wondering if I could use one of you guys. I was thinking you, Matt, to call, and we record it, and you pretend to be our manager. And yeah, try to that's not going to help you any more than you pretending to be your manager would help you. I, you're just so much better at being charismatic than I am. Again, the, I think true charisma comes from the honesty of being yourself. So you're saying is, no? No, I'll do it. Sure, <laughs> I'll do it. But you're I, also I, a pretty charismatic guy. Yeah, don't don't sell yourself short. I think Sometimes the, I feel like today I'm off my uh, the the, re, game. the real. <laughs> you just broke your ankle. And I'm very nervous. Like you guys are the most important guests in my like, hey, idea of this. Hey, come on, to me, hey, honestly. That's not fair to the other guests. Not only that, but you just showed us a check with Nathan Fielder's <laughs> name on it and a million dollars. Yes. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> now I'm like, fuck Nathan. These guys are way better. Right. He'll actually come on the show. No, Shane's legitimately. This is all uh, he was keen. The minute he literally like 
fucking binged everything you guys have ever done. Well, and I broke my ankle yesterday, so I was going to be so much more organized. And I wasn't going to come into work today, but I was like, fuck, this is Nirvana the band day. Because my boss said, don't come in. But I, I had to come in to see you guys. Well, I'm really happy you did. That's a bummer, man. Yeah, so the phone call, maybe we could end the <laughs> interview with, because we have an attachment to this. Uh, no, we, we know about it. those attachments well. Yeah. So you're willing to do that? Sure. Again, uh, I don't know. One, I don't think he'll pick up the phone. Could just make for good radio. Uh, yeah. At the very least, at this point, I'm just grasping at straws. I can tell. <laughs> 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 but I also have a question, because uh, I am involved kind of in a legal matter. And you guys know a lot about... Uh, <laughs> I hope this just... <laughs> Starts turning more into you self-help some some problems. <laughs> See, I got a I got this girlfriend. <laughs> okay, well she was living with me rent free for a while. Okay? Let me let me start earlier. Let me start earlier. Um, well, this, this is about a uh, parody. Uh, yeah. If, to be a proper parody, does it need to be comedic? Can, no. Can, it can be a serious parody. Yes. And it, what are the elements where it needs to be to make it legal? Well, it depends. Like there's 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 a couple of different distinctions that will make something uh, that will not invalidate, but will allow you to use somebody's copyright. Uh, the biggest one is how necessary is it for telling your story? Um, are you in any way making it so that the original copyright holder cannot profit from their IP anymore? For the most part, the answer is no, unless you're disparaging them, like you have Mickey Mouse like with a swastika on his shirt or something like that. Um, so that wouldn't work. Um, and how much of it are you using? Are you using the bare minimum to get your point across? Mm -hmm. And if you follow those three guidelines, you're, you're pretty safe. Um, That's what sometimes use, you can't use too little of it, right? It can't well, be it, subtle. You have to, oh, it, no, has it has to be, to be an overt. obvious. It has to be overt. overt. Who are you trying to get? Uh, do you know? No. Uh, he's like the biggest, like you've probably seen him a thousand times. He's, he'll probably always go show up on your Facebook feed scrolling. He's uh, like yeah. the social media. Yeah. yeah. I was trying to motivate my friend. He's a director and he's looking for freelance work. So I suggested he get a book. So he did. And he's like kind of liking. And then I was at a hotel once flipping through the channels and I saw a commercial that was almost identical to one my friend had done a couple of years prior. It was actually a concept I had come up with that my friend had uh, elaborated on and directed. These, right. This great commercial spot had actually won a bunch of awards for Bell, World Pro Max Awards. And I was like, holy shit, Khan, get a load of this. So Khan's obviously uh, obsessed with finding out who created this. Turns out it was <laughs> corporation who did this. And Khan's like, he has two kids. He hasn't had the best year for freelance. He's a very talented director. And then this multi-million dollar corporation is kind of crushed them so i i created some screen grabs well the here's here's the funny thing this is not in any way you he, this guy could never consider this to be parody in a million years because uh purely commercial work holy shit yeah, these are two different spots yeah holy they shit they can't they can't has they, randall seen this they can't be protected no, I haven't. um now the next part is because your commercial first of all a commercial can never be uh I shouldn't say never, but it would be very rare for an actual commercial to get a judge to favorably look at them in terms of uh, necessarily having fair use from another commercial, ever. Like, that's, that's almost never going to happen. So what you can do so hard in the commercial world because there's no IP associated with this, right? Because there's, it's not like there's a chain of title mm -hmm. for, this, for, this, uh, for this commercial, which is how most fiction work. Uh, oh, look at this. Oh yeah! Oh, they fucked you. Yeah, they got you, man. They That's fucked you completely. Nuts. Um, so, so yeah, it's clear that they stole your concept and that they watched your commercial and then and then took it. But, um, but in terms of their ability to claim fair use or fair dealings in Canada against that, that is zero. Um, but I'm not sure what protects commercials in this country. In fact, I'm not sure if anything does. That's a question for a entertainment lawyer because oh no you can keep those papers no no, <laughs> no, no i need no, them no, i'm yeah. kidding <laughs> so that's exhibit a my yeah. friend um but but uh but our like the the copyright infringement that we do is not um is not anywhere in the even in the same world as that so if you talk to a lawyer and said okay my commercial was stolen what you could do is talk to the production company that made that commercial and maybe make a civil case that it was stolen, but that's uncharted territory for us. But, it but is, in it your is, opinion, it's a ripoff, though, right? In my opinion, yeah, yes, yeah. totally. Yeah, it looks like. It's but I don't know how you can uh, 
own any of that. Because again, there's no chain of title associated with it. Here's what I mean by that. If in, so let's say like there's a Coen Brothers movie and they do an amazing shot at this one location that looks really beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and then in Nirvana the Band, we go to that same location, shoot the exact same shot, but we don't include any IP related things like music or, um, uh, or copyrighted uh, like brands in the same frame. There's no recourse that the Coen Brothers would have against us taking that shot. And, but, and doing it exactly, but right. again, it's very tough because in commercial work, a lot of people don't care. It's like, oh yeah, one commercial stole from another commercial. Unless you could really make the case that your friend is like, it's yeah, if it ruined his life, yeah, then then you could make a case for it. You, you mentioned how your characters kind of live in the '90s. In episode uh, two, chapter two, uh, you see a bunch of rollerbladers. And you're like, oh, was I culturally taking a nap? If so, this is a long fucking nap. If roller and yet uh, they are back. <laughs> but your characters kind of wouldn't you not think that's weird to see rollerbladers since you um, guys are so into the '90s? No, or is this, this not an over? Oh no, of course no. It's, it brings up a great point, which is that Matt, in it's awesome that that this is the kind of guy who can be so geeky and into certain things that he thinks are great, but the things that he wasn't either into or the things that he was into and got made fun of, he's very quick to project the things that he heard onto other people. Because you'll notice later on in that Hackers episode when we're rollerblading, Jay and I are pretty good at rollerblading. Yeah. Clearly we've rollerbladed <laughs> yeah. before. Funny story, when we needed to get rollerblades for that hacking episode, we went to a rollerblading store this and were trick. sold rollerblades by one of those rollerbladers. <laughs> wow. Swear to God. God. Recognized from, <laughs> Swear so, to God. Small world of rollerbladers. Yeah. 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 The rollerblading <laughs> yeah. community yeah. is small. But yeah, that's a, that's a good example of projection that, that, that only kind of came... Uh, full circle in season two, which is that Matt is so derisive of rollerbladers, and then you realize, oh no, he likes rollerblading, <laughs> and somebody made fun of him, and so now he he's... did like rollerblading. Yeah, I loved it in in the nineties. Yeah, he's a, I rollerbladed. It's a great rollerblader. Everywhere. I was a skateboarder. <laughs> I rollerbladed you, literally everywhere. Do you have a rule that any kind of substance is like the first time you've ever had it before? You've never had coffee before in the show, except you have it for the first time in the show. Yes. You've never drank before. In yes. The show. Normally with Matt, yes. Um, uh, with Jay is always like a, quite a bit cooler than, than Matt and I think experiments with or has experimented with more things or at least acts like he has, which is important. But That's for, like my favorite episode of The Wonder Years or one of them is when Kevin is drinking for the first time and Paul... His best friend, you guys watched. Of the course. Movie. You know, they're out there, uh, they're drinking, and they don't really want to drink. They're in the woods with a cooler, older kid. They got to. They and, and then, so Kevin's like, I don't know, but Paul's acting like he does it all the time. So he has, like, a, mm -hmm. a, a beer, and he's like, you got any smokes? He's like, I love to have a cigarette when I'm drinking. <laughs> like, he fully commits yeah. to the fact that oh, yeah. it's sort of in the same dynamic. Well, we yeah. do the exact same, basically faking it. Yeah. So, so the, yes, basically whenever, like, we would never just be casually, like, you know, using drugs or casually... These guys don't casually do anything. Like, you get the sense that all they do is this one thing, and then when you I introduce a new variable, they react to it as though they've never encountered like this thing before. Like a 13-year-old, like you were saying. The innocence is, like, a big, important huge, part of the character. Huge, huge. They're basically locked in the way that they were when they had their 13th birthday and are like, okay, so anything that gets introduced to them, we try to play it as though, what would a 13-year-old do if you just gave this to them for the first time? All right. I think this is, like, half an hour longer than we're supposed to go. But... Yeah. Are you kidding? It's such a treat. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I just want to tell everyone listening that this is one of my favorite shows, if not my favorite show. Everyone should watch this show on iTunes. That's how I was able to find it, unless there's a better way. But, well, no, iTunes is perfect. I think you can still get it on demand on some channels in Canada. You can also type in Google, watch Nirvana the Band online, and look for like a Put Locker <laughs> link or that's something cheaper like than that. $20. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's yeah. the free way. Yeah. I think it's also on Google Play and maybe Amazon. Um, but uh, is it going to be on Netflix at any point? Maybe, okay. maybe we're 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 Fingers sort of trying crossed. to figure that out right now. Because I was trying to get his brother to watch it, but he's like, "Oh, iTunes, forget about it." My like, brother, ah. it is it is a real barrier to entry. That's yeah. for sure. Okay, so I guess can we end with the phone call part? It could just if ring. Matt's down. The person I'm sure may not it will. Answer. Yeah, let's call him. We'll All right, let's do it right now. This Guys, is going to be great. So much. Thanks for coming on. By hey, the thank way, thank you. Kidding. This Pleasure. We loved it. We love being in the much building. <laughs> Stop this, record it, make sure you know that. What's his name? Do you hear ringing? Uh, it's a woman, Christy. Christy, yeah, I hear it.
Oh, I need to talk into this. Shit. Yeah, of course, dude. Of course, it's just ringing. I mean, you're, this is a Los Angeles area code. <laughs> These people don't pick up. I think they have blockers for Canada. Canada. Yeah. You don't happen to have a phone that's uh, American that we could use. Oh yeah, I have it right with me. <laughs> you do. Oh, Please. Okay. Not okay, dude. This is one of those smart managers. Not only is she not picking up, she doesn't have an answering machine. She knows what she's fucking doing. Christy. Fuck. So n no American phone, a dumb question. But Even if you did, look, I, I got to tell you something. You don't become Nathan Fielder's manager by having an answering machine. Fuck. All right. Fuck. All right, no, we fucked it. No. All right, guys. It's yeah, been fun. Yeah. Welcome to everybody's favorite part of the show and back in the studio after having a baby, our pop culture aficionado, Shane Cunningham. Shane, this is the, I, never, I still don't know how to say it, the Shane, Shane Stravaganza. The Shane Stravaganza. Also on the phone is, is Max Kerman calling in from Hamilton, Ontario. Max, you still with us, buddy? I'm with you, baby. What did you think of that interview, Max? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't make it through. No. no. Uh, <laughs> Well, I will listen to it once it's out. Right. But I'm not, as I said, I'm not, I'm not going to get in the way because maybe, you know, I'd interfere and I'd demand that more cuts were had. Usually I like to keep my interviews a little trimmer. Okay. Uh, Mike knows, Mike knows that. So uh, it's better that I stay out of it. Yeah. So, so for our listeners, Max clearly hasn't heard the interview. We're recording this before Max has reviewed the interview. And yeah. this this dessert, by the way, is one of the longest, if not the longest dessert too. So. Oh, it's definitely. So you always say long story long, mm -hmm. and I'm going to say long episode longer here because <laughs> what this dessert is, I was recently up at Long Point Lodge, which is owned by my former boss and mentor, J.R. Diggs. And our friend, Max and I are friends with J.R. And yep. so he basically, not only did he give Nathan Fielder his start in television, mm. he actually gave Matt Johnson, who's in Nirvana, the band, the show, his start in TV. It's all connected. And I didn't even know that until I was telling JR that this dessert was going to be in the Nirvana the Band, the show episode. So I would have talked about this during this brief interview I did with him. Well, this long interview I did with him. Because <laughs> <laughs> what you're about to hear is a, it was a three-hour conversation around a campfire that was kind of a drunken talk that started at 2 a.m., and ended at about 5 a.m. So, like, the light was coming up as this ended. And JR sent me some texts that he just wanted me to, to do. If I was doing a preamble, he told me to say these things. And if anybody doesn't know who JR <laughs> Diggs is, he had a great show on uh, television uh, all around Ontario, and I believe Canada nationally, uh, throughout the 2000s. Yeah, he had, it, his show actually aired before Saturday Night Live, so it did very well in the ratings, and his story is fascinating. So if you, if you bear with me here, and I know, you know you're probably getting tired of listening to this episode, it's just half an hour more, and there, it, gets in a pretty interesting, <laughs> <laughs> it gets into pretty interesting stuff, including how Nathan Fielder got, got started on his show and how he kind of, a little tease, would be uh, not screwed over Nathan, but... What's the word? Betrayed Nathan? Uh, I don't burned, know. burned a bridge, burned with, a Nathan. bridge yeah. with Nathan. You'll find out that story. Uh, but this, these are notes from JR. He said, uh, make sure in your interview you tell them how random this was, that we were drunk. We talked for hours. I had to edit it together. And JR is very concerned about people editing conversations he has together. Mm. Uh, JR says he hasn't done anything in a long time and is bas basically hidden away from the world down at Long Point, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a big deal for him. Uh, and that I know the one dude, oh, and then he gets into talking about uh, Nirvana the band. Uh, and he said, basically everyone got their start in TV entertainment from him and on his show. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, period. Everybody. Like everybody in the world. Just to generalize a little bit. But that's the preamble, and you're about to listen to now uh, J.R. Diggs and I around a campfire, kind of drunk, talking about life and career and entertainment industry. If I could just add one quick thing. Yeah. Uh, I actually hung out with J.R. yesterday uh, in Hamilton. Uh, we, we had some biz to talk about, and just we were catching up. And... Lauren uh, ended up meeting up with us afterward, and she just like 
she's like, w- you know, there's a lot of people, Max, who'd love to, you know, probably have a couple hours of your time and you clearly like can't make time for everybody. But like, why does, why do you always make time for J.R. Diggs? Like, like, like you go out of your way to text him to go hang. And I was like, because when you meet J.R., as you said, like you can get into a conversation with J.R. Diggs for like literally six hours or he'll tease you with like something that's like pretty tantalizing, like a story that you really want to hear. And then if you don't rein him in, it'll take about six hours to get to the point. <laughs> no. It's, it's, it's kind of insane. And so, and she's just like, How, why do you, and I was like, yeah, it's a good question, but there's something about JR that is just so lovable uh, that you want, you just like his company or something. Like, well, how would you guys, like, why do, why do we like hanging around with JR Diggs so much? Cause I really do. But on the surface, he might come off as like sort of like an overly talkative, like kind of in your face kind of guy, but he's so sweet and so nice. What, what, what is his charm guys? Well, can, I can think, articulate that? I think for me, my fear is always, and anytime I avoid a social situation, it's just that what if I encounter an awkward moment or something that happens? Like I have this irrational fear that always there's going to be some cringe worthy, awkward thing that's going to happen. But with JR, it never does. He handles everything because he's always talking. There's never been an awkward pause in my entire life with JR. And I'm always comfortable and have faith that I'm going to have a good time when I'm with him. You know, that's very true. And I think that's one of the reasons why I like going out with him because he's such a hospitable kind of host uh, when it comes to any social situation. He just wants to put everybody at ease. If I go out, like he is the alpha personality. Like I love going to West Town uh, Bar and Grill on Lock Street with him just because I just get to be the guy who doesn't say anything. And normally I feel like it's my responsibility to create conversation, to make sure that people are feeling good. When I'm around JR, he does everything. What you're talking about is it's like, you know how like uh, LeBron handles the ball all the time, a point guard. But then, you know, sometimes it's nice just to have another ball handler so he can just kind of walk up the court. I feel like when you, when you hang out with JR, one, he's such a genuinely sort of nice and great dude. Uh, and two, like you said, it's like he, he's going to carry the conversation. So you can kind of just chill and not have to, like, be pressured full court while you're dribbling the ball. Exactly. And to what you were also saying is he does a million digressions where you almost want to kill him and have him get to the <laughs> point. So, so when I brought up the fact that not only is this our longest episode, but I have this long dessert to accompany it, you guys were like, uh, maybe, you know, it might be hard if, if it's JR, like it's going to be overly long. But I had to cut out a million digressions just to make the stories listenable. That, yeah, <laughs> Thank I, you for I, your I time, JR. <laughs> You're welcome, JR. <laughs> After all that buildup. <laughs> okay. So... Here, I'm giving you the, uh, this is the good microphone. One, Wait, where do I, what do I do? Just talk into this? Let's snap on three. One, two, three. Perfect. I did it perfect? Yeah. I talk into it like a microphone? Yeah, just like this. I don't understand any of this anymore. I'm so far removed <laughs> from this world. I, the technology's, uh, it's pretty uh, awesome. So, we're going to clink it? Yeah, clink it. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Hometown drinking. But I was supposed to have you on the podcast a while ago. Yeah. You told me you would give me a free night stay <laughs> at, where are we right now? Long Point Lodge. Why well, can't you remember that? I can. I'm just trying to give you a plug. <laughs> See, I forget. I used to be the biggest, um, you're allowed to say words like whore and stuff like that on your, uh. Oh, yeah. Um, any part of you that is, uh or like or uh is that... <laughs> you would have learned from me people are going to take that the wrong way no they don't know that we have a history a yeah, long well, history could you explain to people how you and i came to know each other yeah i decided to sneak into much music because i was never invited to anything in those days the much music video one. yeah i decided the best way to sneak in was to rent a limo and then get in the limo line <laughs> with all the other cars pull up where the stars and the celebrities are and so this is like 15 years ago so this was much easier to do security yeah at life. least 15 years ago yeah maybe well, it was 17 so, years it ago. was so easy in those days because they if you're getting out of a limo and you're in the line you must be one of the celebrities of course so that was a good plan and it did work great and i used to walk into these events wearing a headset and a clipboard right 
Yeah. So same thing. Yeah, sure. Probably learned that from me too. No, man, we're just kindred spirits. Oh, you did you did that before me? Independent. I want to start taking credit for fucking everything I know. of everybody. So you're in the limo, and I roll down the window for some reason because you were rolling down the window to anyone who uh, would seem like a celebrity. Yeah. And I had a camera crew with me. Right, you did you because you were like yeah kindred spirits like you, you said you're basically yeah doing the same thing I was doing which is probably why we ended up you know working together. What, just to tell the audience what I was doing I was interviewing every limo that pulled up. Mm. I rolled down the window and you pretty enthusiastically scream, Jr. Diggs! <laughs> oh my God, Jr. Diggs! And. Me being uh, pretty much a nobody was pretty uh, happy <laughs> somebody knew who I was. <laughs> and so we did a full interview. So our meeting, our first meeting, first time we ever met, was on from each other's lens, really. Yeah. I was filming you. You were filming me. I earned me. it on my TV show. And, oh, and then, <laughs> and so I was watching your TV show by, at this point, by the way, religiously. And I'm like, oh, my God, what if we're on J.R. Diggs' show? <laughs> Then we watch, yeah. and we're on your show. <laughs> you featured us. I'm like, holy shit, I'm on the Jared Dig show. <laughs> yeah. So then I email you. Yeah. I'm like, hey, I'm the guy you met on camera. <laughs> I'm the Jared Diggs guy. I have this company called Snatch TV. <laughs> I do craziest shit ever, you'll ever see. Here's this video of my mom's cheating boyfriend <laughs> in this documentary. And I'm thinking you're never going to get get back to me. You're like, dude, this is insane. We, he's like, we have to have a meeting. I'm like, okay, you meet me at a Tim Hortons <laughs> near my house. And next thing I know, I'm on your crew. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because you were willing to work for nothing. Yeah. For pizza, pizza coupons. Exactly. And I thought your video was... Back then, like everybody does outrageous shit now, and it's just normal, and everybody's shocking and provocative. But back then, it was provocative and shocking. Like your your video was funny, but not like in a in a to me it wasn't in a malicious way. I've always I never really appreciated that style of comedy. Like I used to obviously maybe get compared to Tom Green back in the day, and I would resent that because it's too mean spirited. I thought it was. And, and, and I thought, but you're referring to my documentary about my mom's cheating boyfriend. That w I didn't find it was, um, mean spirited. I thought it was like, it was that fine line between like, Oh my, like, Oh my God. And funny and amusing, but provocative. Like, and that's hard to find that line. See, and that doc had a lot of, was very polarizing yeah, for people. Yeah. For but sure. you luckily fell on the side where you thought it w I wasn't being totally mean. No, no, not at all. I thought it was like uh, moving in some ways too. Like yeah. it was like you're like you're standing I up for so your too. mom, exactly. and you were like you were just being a protective uh, son, and it was emotional, and uh, it was brilliant. And I was like, I'm gonna meet this kid for sure. And then when I did, and I don't know, you just were keen, and and I was doing the show by myself. Mm -hmm. So what is it harm for me to have some kid helping me I out? I started out as your cameraman. Yeah. And then I worked my way on to being Shane the cameraman, which was a character who played a cameraman, <laughs> who actually was the cameraman. That's right. Then I was like a writer on the show. Then I was like a producer on the show. Then I was like co-host. I got you. You started paid, though. Oh, you started paying me? Right. <laughs> and I think I was getting paid like $15 an hour, which by, back then, that yeah. was an insane amount of money. Right. I couldn't believe it. Right. And I was on TV. Yeah. <laughs> and I was I felt like I was famous. Yeah. And in Hamilton, like I was getting recognized. Right. So it was a pretty thrilling time. And then you started a new series called In the Can with J.R. Diggs, where you were... Um, showcasing young and up-and-coming filmmakers yeah. and doing a documentary series on the making of them making short films. Right. And you let me make two short films yeah. in which uh, one was Teen Wolf 3 yeah. and one was called Cops. Which is my favorite, one of my favorite, uh, what is it, a piece? Is it a short film, obviously, it's a film. but it's, a, it's one of my favorite uh, viewing experiences to this day. Well, you it's aired brilliant. it nationally. It's but it's brilliant, and it's not only hilarious. yeah, and so not only do you air the short film, you air a documentary on the making of it. So when people see the short film, they actually appreciate the work that goes into it. Sure, yeah. And that was actually the series that you featured Nathan Fielder on. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. He played a pizza pizza maker. 
Can you tell the tale of how you started Nathan <laughs> Fielder's career? Sure. Why? Do you find that hard to believe? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Unnecessary uh, pause. No, but this drama. is the truth. So Nathan Fielder was a young, aspiring comic, video guy, just had moved to Toronto. I was easily approachable. But Nathan Fielder, his first appearance on television ever was on my show. When you met him, could you tell he had a special talent? Or I l thought he was super funny to the point where I had no money when I did my show. And I, I, I didn't find many people funny. I still don't. And I always found you funny. So Nathan Fielder was on the show, first time he was ever on TV. And then we got talking. I thought he was really funny, obviously deadpan. Nice guy, though, too. Really mm -hmm. another nice person, nice guy, got along with him. And I wanted him to write with me. I wanted him to, uh, to, do, to help me on the show. Because I was just like, as you know, feeding people with Pizza Pizza coupons. And yeah. they were a sponsor of the show. And guys like you, anybody that I could get to help me, I didn't have a big budget. I was just uh, stumbling away the best I could. And so Nathan's pitch to me was he had this funny bit that he did. And he shot. I still probably have it. And he said, yeah, yeah, I understand you can't pay and you can't, you know, you don't have a budget and stuff like that. But I would like, how about you do, you put um, NathanFielder.com on the video and that'll be like my payment. So he was smart. He was savvy. He wasn't just taking yeah. pizza, pizza coupons like you. <laughs> yeah. He was like, I, I should try to get something else out of this. This show is airing nationally on Saturday nights. And so either before or after Saturday Night Live, depending on where you were in the country. So it wasn't like it was not being seen by anybody. You had some pretty, I had some pretty major sponsors and stuff. And, and, uh, and I, I guess I was, I don't know. I had integrity still, or I had, uh, you told Nathan Fielder, no, well, it just seemed like so lame. It sound, it seemed so because he was completely unknown, right? He was yeah. a complete unknown. No one knew who, who, nobody had ever heard of him. No one. Mm -hmm. he, and he wasn't even in Toronto that long. I forget, he's a west somewhere where he lives. Where, yeah, Vancouver. Do, do you know? Okay. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and we just met. Like I said, back then, I guess I thought more of myself than I should have. Like the same old this mm -hmm. story that so many, you know, before me have, have, uh, have told. And I was just like, oh, dude, that's, you know, I'm not doing that. I'm not, that looks ridiculous. It's like NathanFielder.com. Like, so I can't, is there a way for us to make it funny? And he was just like, oh, I just want people, you know, like people to go to my website or to know who did it. And I said, I just thought it's, it was tacky. Correct me if I'm wrong here. Also tell me not to use this if you don't want it. But when he was trying to go to the States, yeah. did he ask you for a reference letter? How do you know this? I, I'm, I don't know if you told me or if I heard it somehow. So, oh, I feel... It, well, we don't have to use it. No, I'm happy to use it. Maybe this is my chance to apologize to him, yeah. <laughs> if he cares. But people sometimes, like, what they don't know about me is that for... You know this, so know please that. say this is true. I, for, you know, decade and a half of my life, it was just... It was a constant struggle, 16 hours a day, Produ independently producing a, a nationally aired TV show by myself, though, pretty much, right? A couple, whoever, a couple volunteers like you, whoever I get to help me, people perceived it as a real show. Mm -hmm. But it was just like my life was in torment and a constant struggle just to get through to another week, just to get through to another show, to hopefully get to be that to be the one to take me to where I wanted to be. And any extra work, any extra effort, any anything extra in my life other than just how to get through uh, this next week or get it just it was going to fall through the cracks. And so he was going to the States and obviously wanted was trying to get a green card, I think, or something like that. I think he ended up writing. He was trying to get a job as a writer on uh, uh, what was that show? The comic with the with the nose kind of shit. Come on. Dark hair guy. Uh, Mar uh, what's uh, comic? Kind of like a weird sense oh, of humor. Oh, I know. Um, Adrian. He is like a, a bold. Yeah, guy. yeah. What's his name? Fuck, he's funny. I think Nathan was writing for him or wanted to get a job on that yeah, show. Jerk. And uh, somebody will you know, hopefully be listening to this and, and tell you That's eventually. Yeah. Dimitri. Uh, yeah, Dimitri something. Yeah. Wow, see how quickly you forget? He was hot for a little bit. 
Dimitri we, Martin. There you go. And we don't even remember his name. That's the in, that's the industry we live in. Wow. Um, then you wonder why no one gives a shit about me anymore or cares enough to even want me on a pod after 102 episodes. <laughs> I don't blame you guys. Um, but uh, but he he was he had to prove that he had worked in television and he was looking for credits and, and references because then I would have, I suppose, helped him get a green card. I never attempted this myself, so I don't know how the process goes. And you were like, first you want the website, now you want a <laughs> reference letter. What is it with this guy? I just, and I, yeah, I should have done it, obviously, if I was a good guy, but I just, and it's not that I was a good guy or didn't do it. I just, I don't know, man. There was never enough hours in the day for me to just, deal with my own shit or get my own shit done and i just i'm forgetful sometimes and and i just never did that for him so uh so yeah i've never really done anything for him i guess but so that's why i, I should because say. you're the type of guy who if i asked you to write me a reference letter yeah. you'd say dude write anything you want just i don't want it i think i said it. that to him yeah. I think I remember saying something to that effect, just saying, yeah, Nathan, just write it. Yeah, you, you're what not do I got to do? Yeah, like, I'll just write it. I'm sure it'll be great. Mm -hmm. And if I have to sign it, I'll sign it. But that extra 15 minutes to write it, that's just not going to happen. Yeah. Realistically, I am trying to punch out another episode by, you know, delivered by, by 5 o'clock. So, um, and that was my life. I was consumed by it. So, uh, yeah, so I, I, I started his career... And then uh, did nothing for him after that. Yeah, you almost ended it there too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could have ended it if he didn't end up getting his Greek card and, and uh, getting onto the States. And wow, has he ever got a career now? But he's a nice guy. Every time I see him, we, we say polite uh, hellos. How come you can't get him on the pod? What's the problem? Um, What's really? Seriously. I bet you I could probably get a hold, try to get a hold of him. We try, he's so like Andy yeah. Kaufman-esque. Yeah, yeah. Like he doesn't like. So he, he has a friend named Chris Locke. Who do you know who that is? No, Comedian. I don't like him already. But he's his best friend. Yeah, right. And he's he's, like he's been on his podcast. Yeah. So we tried a thing with ours where we actually interviewed Chris, but with the whole intention to kind of get Nathan sure. through Chris. Yeah, because you're a manipulative, uh, uh, coercive mother effort. Yeah, I guess we thought it would be funny, but Chris didn't like it at all. He didn't. No, and he asked us for, to remove the episode. He did. Yeah, and you know how I broke my ankle recently, yeah. right? So yeah, I had... Now, though. You look like you're... Yeah, I'm hopping around now. Yeah. But this was right around that time I was off work for breaking my ankle, and I had actually intended to message Chris and tell him the crux of the bit. Are we out of beer here? Wow. I know. Yeah, go on, sorry. I had intended to email Chris Locke and mm -hmm. see if he was okay with it, but I, we didn't. Yeah. The episode went out. Chris said, <gasps> remove oh, this episode. Oh, off? Yeah. So, and I feel horrible about no, it. Don't. I do. Oh, everybody's got to feel horrible all the time in this world we live in now. Everybody's oversensitive. Mike does really, really nice interviews, but he would never offend anybody on this podcast. Would no, he? no, he wouldn't. Yeah, but that's the world we live in well, now. Here's, here's the everybody thing. is like worried. You remember the, some of the stuff we did on my show? Yeah. You could never do most of that shit anymore. Well, we had one episode where you just sat on a toilet for the entire episode and didn't say a word. Yeah. <laughs> do you feel like your show was ever good? No. Never. never. Maybe the first, out of the first eight episodes, I would say there's four of those episodes that I liked. Right. And, like, that I would, I, I would have been proud of. And honestly, so I made an original eight episodes... And my original goal was get noticed, get good ratings. And by the way, that summer, it was double the ratings of Saturday Night Live. Your um, show was. Yeah, it went. It was. It would always beat Saturday Night Live for years and years, actually. But it was um, way higher ratings than Craig Kilborn was on back then. If yeah. anybody remembers. Late night show, yeah. And uh, and Conan, and my show was had these. Crazy ratings, a three rating. Nobody knows what that is. But most shows, like Saturday Night Live, would get like a 1.2. And I was getting like this three rating. And the goal was, I was like, I did it. I took all this risk. I independently produced the show. Well, the risk you're talking about is you financed the show yeah. through, you had a, a clothing line called J.R. Diggs Pants? Uh, no, J.R. Diggs was um, like a surf line of, of, of skim boards and, and board shorts. And Shag's clothing was my uh, skateboard Line. So through the money you made 
through the Jaredic skin and boards shop. and shags yeah, and shops. Is. You quit that business and use that money that you had made from that business to buy airtime. I bought. So this was fraud. Commercial airtime. No, no, because it, it technically was advertising because I was right. advertising oh, yeah. my shops. So it was an advertising budget. And I was watching an infomercial one night on CH, I guess it was. And I thought, why can't I just buy this at damn airtime mm -hmm. and air my show? Prove that it's going to be a hit show. Which, had anyone ever done that before? Mm, I think that Red Green, you know Red Green? Yeah. I think years before, a decade before, he'd did, done something similar. But you weren't advertising anything? You, I was advertising, like, the only sponsor I had, because I didn't have any sponsors, was my store. Brought to you by Beach Kings, you know, in Porto. But nobody realized that the, the, <laughs> the sponsors were just me, obviously. So how much did each episode cost you? Mm, a lot. I think... I forget the numbers now, Shane. This has been a while since I even thought about this. I thought it was like 30 grand or something. Oh, no, way more than that. I Whoa. think I was into it for, oh, an episode, yeah. yeah. Yeah, like I think that, I think the story goes, honestly, it's, I've, I've started to block a lot of the shit out, I think. Because yeah. I think before I thought it was just part of the story, and then now it's just become a big part of my life, and it's just, um, it's, I don't know if I'd love it <laughs> anymore, because it's not a story anymore. It's just my regretful life. I remember being 120 grand in debt, I think, and then writing a check to myself, a la Jim Carrey with his $10,000 check. I remember writing a check to myself for a dollar, though. And my goal was if I could cash this check someday <laughs> for a dollar, I'm going to be like this. Was That's my a goal pretty big low in point. Life. <laughs> no, but it was like real to me because it didn't work out. I bought this airtime. I couldn't get the show picked up by anybody. <laughs> I was the cover of TV Times, which is kind of cool. I don't even know what that is. It's like the, the TV Guide, basically. Oh, it's, cool. It was like the, the TV Guide, but it was TV Times was, I think, the Globe and Mail's the version. The Playgirl cover is what really blew me away. <laughs> See, why are we having more fun? Why did you take this to like the, one of those late-night conversations, a couple drunk guys just uh, depressing people? Like, well, why, just, like, why have you I, done this, I, Shane, to your audience? Well, Diggs. So many times, no one t has gotten the full story. Like, right. they get it in fragments, <laughs> but there's so many digressions. Like, I'll, I'll have to chop yeah, this in order. Yeah. But where were we? Why were we talking about my, that, what I did then? Oh. I, I, I bought this airtime. The goal was to prove that I could have a hit show. And I guess my thought was the network would go, holy shit, what is this show? And then I did it. I guess I did it. I had these great ratings that first summer, summer so of 2001. Summer of 2001, you did eight shows. Each show cost $30,000, and out of... I don't know if it was 30, but I remember it being in debt by the end of the summer. And out of those shows, you thought four of those were good shows? Mm, if I really tried hard to think here. But you're proud of some of the work you did, is what I'm trying Yeah, probably half of those shows. And then you eventually started... You kind of reversed the model, because eventually you started spending, like virtually nothing on your episodes right. and making a lot of money well it, but it, you weren't proud of them correct so at some point along the way i guess i just gave up i thought after a decade not even a decade after a half a decade i guess this isn't going to work like no network is going to is recognizing these ratings or this show or what i've done there, it's not it my. It didn't work, so. But you started getting sponsors. Yeah, so I just said, "Fuck it, I'm just gonna get, make money," and I got. I know I have great ratings, so the sponsors all loved it. If the networks weren't seeing it, the the so, sponsors certainly were. I think it was Molson or Labatt who were both fantastic sponsors of my show for years and years and years. So so was Pizza Pizza and PlayStation. And I remember the guys in one of the beer companies, whichever one it was, saying, like, dude, like, you, you, you're you as high, highly sponsored money-wise as, as the trailer park boys were mm -hmm. at the time. I just realized this didn't work. I guess it's not going to work out for me. I'm just going to start keeping all the money and just not pour any more into this show and just give up on this dream and then so I you guess, literally like sold out yeah uh, yeah i guess that would be the ultimate sellout yeah that's too bad but i think that that's what happens over like dude it was like like you said it was 12 years and 42 weeks like at some point is that actually the, the yeah. real stats how many yeah and so i don't know most people are 
are, are can put on that act or put on that persona for a little while, but for over a decade, like at some point, I, don't, I just would start to burn out and start. It would just became a job, right? And the sponsor money was good, and you keep doing it. But um, yeah, so it was very. It was pretty lucrative for you. Uh, yeah, everything worked out great. And uh, um, and here we are now, you know, I get to be a beach bum down here in Long. So you don't, you're not upset that your career in entertainment didn't work out? Well, did it not work out? I'm here now, enjoying this life. No, so, so that's what I'm asking. Because sometimes you come to me, boo-hoo, I want to kill myself. And other times you're like, look at you. Kill myself or kill you and Mike and Max for not having me on your pod? <laughs> um, no, I'm... I clearly uh like are you happy? Oh no. <laughs> no <laughs> chance of that. I didn't reach any of my goals. I didn't get to do what I want to do. The show never got to become this is the boo-hoo part that mm -hmm. comes in. Yeah. But I think I'm justified when I say at the at the six year mark or whatever it was, I was smart enough and intuitive enough to know that. You know, even the Conan and O'Briens of the world that are your, you know, heroes and Letterman before me and everything, they're as good, let's face it, they're as good as the writing teams that they have around them. Like, look at the people who write for these shows or the credits that are on the show. And I just was doing it by myself. All by, like, literally by myself. Well, I was there with you. Yeah, yeah, you were. But there kind of came a point when I ended up doing the show in my van for the last five or six years because I literally could do it by myself. Mm. Just click on all the cameras and do the whole show by myself because it became hard. Even guys like you got to a point where you're like, dude, like, is there any way you could like pay me like more, like give me a real career? I didn't do that. What happened was our show got canceled and you said, Shane, I'm going to pay you to clean my toilet. <laughs> and, and I said, JR, I can't take your money to clean your toilet. And I think cleaning toilets are easy, by the way. I have no problem with shit or piss or anything. But I was just like, I can't take his money, and we're not working on creative stuff. I, w I never said, pay me more. No, no, no. But I, no, but you're the you're an aspiring young talented guy like Nathan Fielder. You, those are the kind of people that are going to expect to have real careers. I would have been, had a great show not because of me, but because of the talented people I would have surrounded myself with, who were the literally probably the most talented young gifted people in the country and i couldn't offer you or nathan or um sean right. menard yeah he's a gr fantastic director winning awards he was he uh, started on your show as a boom operator yeah. <laughs> right. it was sean the boom guy <laughs> and of course sean menard went on to direct the carter effect which is vince carter's documentary which is on netflix right now just watched it the other night is it good i liked it a lot okay. yeah i'm proud of him it was great. No, I was at the premiere. I knew, I knew the answer. I don't think I got invited to the premiere. No, you didn't <laughs> sign that reference letter. <laughs> I didn't get invited to that either. I'm just full of regret and remorse and, bridges, and pool full of my own sadness down here on the point. Yeah. So this might be a dumb question, but what feels better? Doing a show where you like the content you're producing, but you're losing $30,000 maybe an episode, or doing a show where you don't necessarily like it but you're making a lot of money per episode i think you can always make money at doing what i'm doing here and these beautiful little cabins <laughs> down at the beach a little bit of plug here sorry and oh is it did it die hmm. are we dying? possibly we still got this guy we've talked so long we've killed the batteries in your microphones yeah. for the first time ever holy shit my battery died well, we've been talking for hours, dude. To answer your question, what a depressing way to end this, all this. All, keep your integrity. Like, I mean, you can make money doing a million other things, but you go through your life being... And it was a tough one because people would have thought I was on TV and I got the show and I must be happy and having a great life and, and meeting all these, you know, lots of famous people from George Clooney to Sean Penn to... You could go on and on about all the people I've met and the situations I've been in. But the fact is, every episode was just another reminder that uh, I'm just embarrassed what people are watching. I remember this kid coming up. Were you with me the time when the kid came up in the pizza place and just started telling me how much my show was horrible? Was that you? No. Oh, shit. I wasn't. That might have been me. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember this guy coming up to me, and he, his friends were so embarrassed. But he said, I've been waiting to meet you 
for so long. And I was like, oh, okay, hi. And he's like, to tell you, your show is the worst. It's like, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. Because everybody, I, no, I had nothing to say to him other than, yeah, I, I yeah, yeah, I know. And that's a shitty way to live. Like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Promote the lies. Promote yeah. the lies. So, a good way to live is uh, down here on the point. Uh, Long Point Lodge. How many cabins we got here? A couple little cute little cabins. We got the Millie. Yeah, the Herald after my grandparents. And uh, we don't have to do a big plug. We can do that another time. Okay. Um, I hope people come down and we can have these depressing chats around the fire <laughs> like you and me. But bring your own beer, please. Thanks for this, Shane. Yeah. We're going to get another we beer? Got, yeah, let's get another and beer. And a pie iron? And, and, and Reese's Pieces are just straight up uh, raspberry or Let's talk cherry. about it off camera. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cheers, buddy. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Am I dropping the fire? No. Oh. <laughs> That's it. That's all. That's our episode. Thank you to Jay and Matt from Nirvana, the band, the show. Thank you to the one and the only J.R. Diggs. And, uh, yeah, you're welcome for the Shane Stravaganza. <laughs> Thank you to Shane. We're coming back. We're happy to have you back, and we're excited to hear all about uh, family life on the next episode. In the meantime, uh, check us out at Mike Much on Instagram and Twitter. Thank you to Jenna uh, and Tara for Jenna for doing the doodles and Tara for putting it all together with the artwork. The Mike Much Podcast is produced by Max Kerman. I'm your host, Mike Gurman. See you next week. If you don't die on the weekend.